So let me uh, do that, first of all, by, by highlighting it. Um, uh, this session is on aligning the college readiness and completion uh, agenda. Uh, uh, you, know, you all have been working for years on college readiness. Many states are now also focusing on improving college access and completion. And this session is going to help us draw the connections between the two. Let me invite the panelists, uh, Stan Jones, Jamie, Jamie Maristosis, Britt Kerwin, Juliet Garcia, and Eloy Oakley up to the stage to begin the panel. And as you come, let me introduce Stan Jones to you, who will be the moderator. Stan has been a good friend for quite a few years. Um, uh, he is the president of Complete College America, a new organization that he will tell you about but he's had a decade-long career in uh, Indiana. He was in the Indiana House of Representatives since the age of 24. He's only slightly older than that now. He was Commissioner of Higher Education in Indiana, a senior advisor to the governor as well, uh, and is the uh, uh, new leader of Complete College America. He's leading a nationwide effort to build a network of states committed to substantially increasing the number of Americans with post-secondary degrees. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Stan. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike, and um, pleased to have this opportunity. Um, just Mike pretty much covered um, what Complete College America is. Pretty simply, we're about a year and a month old. Uh, we have a single focus that's college completion, and as much as we're tempted to get into everything else, we're focused on college completion. Uh, we have the, fortunately, uh, we have five foundations that are supporting us. Uh, Lumina, thank you, Jamie. Uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, Kellogg, Carnegie, and Ford. And our principal uh, uh, focus is, is working with states and primarily working with governors uh, and key leaders, uh, education leaders within those states. And as part of that, um, we really modeled uh, one of our efforts, our key effort, uh, building alliance of states after the American Diploma Project uh, and we now have 23 states that we're working on with that single objective of college completion. You have an outstanding panel here. It's really one of the best that, uh, that I've been uh, uh, associated with, and I've been associated with lots of panels, uh, but this is really one of the best. Uh, we have uh, Juliet Garcia, uh, who's the chancellor of University of Texas Brownsville. She was one of Time Magazine's uh, 10 best college presidents in 2010. Uh, she is also the first Mexican-American woman to lead a college or university in this country. Pretty impressive. Uh, we have um, Elo Oakley over here, superintendent and president of Long Beach Community College. Um, he too uh, started, he started um, as a minority in a community college and graduated from a community college and then uh, later became president of Long Beach um, and is really one of the outstanding community colleges in California when everybody says, you know, where are the great community colleges in California? They look to Long Beach. So we have uh, uh, Eloy Oakley. Eloy? Yeah. Uh, then we have um, Brett Kerwin, Chancellor, University System of Maryland, uh, which is a, a large system in, in Maryland, includes their flagship but many uh, uh, campuses throughout Maryland. Uh, and and Britt has uh, is really been a national leader on the productivity efforts. Um, but, but actually more than that, I, I can tell you, any meeting that I'm in or any discussion that I'm in, uh, when somebody says, well, we need to get a college president, I'd swear, the first one is Britt Kerwin. Whether it's a panel, a meeting, a board, I think he was on Obama's shortlist for vice president. Um, <laughs> he's in demand, so Britt Kerwin. <laughs> and then Jamie Marisotis, um, also a first generation college graduate uh, in his family, uh, also decided that he would uh, pursue making that opportunity uh, affordable and available uh, to many, many minority students. And so he started as founder and president the Institute for Higher Education uh, Policy uh, located here in DC. Uh, who works, they work on many of those issues. And more recently and importantly, uh, he's the president uh, and executive officer of the Lumina Foundation, uh, which has really been uh, a national leader in the college completion 
and productivity efforts. So we have a great panel. Uh, just as a way of, of transitioning from, from Mike to, to this panel, uh, I have a brief analogy. Um, I, I, like you, I think we all love to watch the Olympics and near the end of the track and field events, uh, they're the relay races, um, which are pretty exciting. Um, and what transpires is you think, well, the U.S. team, we've got some pretty good runners. Um, and as they're heading throughout the track, you go from the first runner to the second to the third, and the third runner and the fourth runner, and the baton drops. Now, was it the third runner that dropped the baton or the fourth runner that wasn't ready to get it? And that's really this discussion. It's passing the baton, and it's not only has, higher, has K-12 done the right job in terms of college readiness, but also whether higher education is ready to accept that responsibility and accept that student uh, and have that completion take place. And all too often, we say it's the third runner, the high schools that drop the baton. And there's not been enough discussion about the fourth runner and the responsibilities for higher education. And that's why we have this higher education leadership here today. Um, and, and just, uh, I, and I know you know these things, but just to set the context of the completion agenda very, very briefly, um, one of the, I think, underreported stories in this country today is in the, in the midst of this great recession, uh, when nobody's buying houses and they're not buying cars and they're not shopping, uh, the one thing that they are clearly doing is going to college. And we have record enrollments across this country. Um, and so people who are, and these are many places in community colleges, people taking money they don't have to pay increasing tuition rates and taking on debt that they don't know how they're going to pay. But yet they have decided two things. They've decided their, their pathway through this economic crisis is through education, number one. And secondly, they are redefining the American dream that it's not just owning a house, but that they want a college education for themselves and their children. And this, this message has been so successful that 89% of the high school students say they want a college degree. 75% of the high school students go to college within two years. You have all been successful at sending that message that you do need to go to college, that you can earn more money if you go to college. And in respect to diversity, the freshman class across this country is looking more like this country than it ever has in, in terms of representations of Hispanics uh, and African Americans and even low income and first generation students. Uh, unfortunately, for too many, um, this is really not, uh, it's a broken promise. Uh, and it's not real access in the sense there was a real opportunity to complete. Uh, and so it's a false promise. Uh, the graduation rates uh, for the four-year colleges are about 50%. Uh, for the two-year colleges are about a third. And those are for full-time students. The part-time rates are even lower than that. I could be standing in any state in this country, nobody's challenged me on this yet, and say to you, at the community colleges in this state, 60% of the students that start are taking remedial classes. What to me was more astonishing, and I got this call three or four years ago from the community colleges in Indiana, and they called me up and they said, Stan, this isn't working, your plan's not working. And I said, well, what do you mean my plan's not working? And they said, well, you, you, know, you said we need to send more of these students on to high school, I mean, on to college, um, and they're coming, but they're ending up in remedial courses. And, and I had perceived that remediation was, you know, those 24-year-olds coming back. 60% of the high school students that graduated in the spring and start in the fall are starting in high school classes in college. That, to me, is really astonishing. Now, we can't let the four-year institutions off the hook either. If you're open admission four-year institutions, 30 to 40% of those students are starting remedial courses. So it's against that backdrop that we, we know there, there is and needs to be significant change at the high school level. Um, it's whether at the, at now at the college and university level, uh, whether we're uh, accepting those students, whether we can make those transitions and, and carry the baton, um, and how that relationship is going between the third runner and the fourth runner. So as part of our panel, I want to start uh, with, with Eloy, um, our, our community uh, college president, uh, to talk uh, for a few minutes, and we'll have each one of the panelists talk for just a few minutes, uh, both from his perspective of the, of the students he gets at the community college uh, from high school, 
Um, and also, uh, California has a, a unique uh, assessment system for high school students, and we'd like him to spend a few minutes talking about that as well. So, Roy. All right. Thank you, Stan. Um, you definitely just got me excited, <laughs> because uh, if you're saying that the other states only have 60% of their students coming to them underprepared, I will take that. <laughs> I will take that any day because at Long Beach it's over 90 percent and um, although in California we're unique we don't force students to take um, what we call basic skill classes if they come in underprepared although we're dealing with that now we've learned from Dr. K. McClenney that students don't do optional but um, <laughs> I see some of you have followed K. But seriously, um, the, the situation in California is, is real and you know, we finally decided to look at our data and actually pay attention to it and disaggregate it and figure out what's going on. And it's pretty embarrassing, it's pretty disgusting, uh, particularly for students of color. Um, there's no getting around that. Uh, so I think that, that was a great first step. Now we have to figure out what to do about it. And um, certainly, you know, California Community Colleges, we serve nearly three million students. We are the workhorse of higher education in California. And of course, the students in our community colleges are those students that are the ones that need to get that next step of education in order to help our state economy in California, which is uh, pretty bad right now, turned around. Um, you know, Latinos are becoming the majority of the workforce in California, but if you look at the numbers, maybe about 18% of them who begin their higher education experience complete it. We're not gonna get it done that way. And if you don't buy into the moral imperative, which we haven't bought into for the last couple of decades because we're still pretty miserable in terms of numbers, then we're finally starting to realize that it's an economic impairment. It, it, it's an economic issue. And we've got to turn our state around. The only way we're going to do that is to train people to succeed in the workforce and turn our economy around. So um, in community colleges, uh, the underprepared student is our biggest challenge. Uh, in Long Beach, we take that very seriously. We have a great K-12 partner in the Long Beach Unified School District, and a superintendent who's absolutely 100% committed to working with Long Beach City College and Cal State University Long Beach to figure this out. So much so that um, you know, the, the Cal State University system has had for a number of years now um, the uh, early assessment program. It's an assessment that is uh, given to um, students the junior year of high school. And basically, it's an assessment to determine whether or not they are prepared to go on to the Cal State University system, um, prepared for college or English um, curriculum. And of course, for years, they've, they've had this, and they've been imp implementing it in the K-12 system. Uh, but um, somehow or another, our community colleges never quite paid attention to what they were doing. And, and we continue to have our own assessments Matter of fact, we have 112 colleges in California, and we probably had 112 different assessments, because in California, it, the history has been that every college determines how our students come into our colleges and where they are placed. I know it's crazy, but California, we're a little crazy. Uh, but we're finally starting to realize that this just is not going to work. So in Long Beach, uh, we have what we call the Long Beach College Promise, which is a partnership between the three systems of edu public education, Cal State University Long Beach, Long Beach City College, and Long Beach Unified School District, which, by the way, is the third largest unified school district in California. Um, so we realized that Long Beach Unified was making it mandatory that all of their students in the junior year take the early assessment program. And then we realized that you know, the beauty of this program isn't the test. The beauty of this program is it was forcing a conversation between Long Beach Unified and Cal State Long Beach about what was going on. 
And the light came on for us at Long Beach City College and said, why aren't we part of this conversation? So we started getting involved with Long Beach Unified, started asking questions of the Cal State University system. Chancellor's office happens to be in Long Beach, so we could just come across the, the city and pop in on Allison Jones over here, who, uh, who leads the effort there at the Cal State University system, and start asking questions. Why aren't we using this assessment? If every junior is taking it, why aren't we paying attention to the results? If it's saying whether or not a student is college ready for the Cal State University system, why wouldn't they be college ready for the community college system? Again, another one of those crazy things we do in California. UC, CSU, and community college system have never agreed on what is college ready, which is problem one that Stan has pointed out. We keep blaming the K-12, but we can't even get our act together in the higher ed system. So, uh, so the test now in Long Beach, we use the results albeit they're sad results. I mean, only about 18% of our students are passing um, uh, the, the, the English portion. But we are finally at a point where those 18%, if they come to Long Beach City College, they are automatically placed in college English, or if they pass college math, math they're, they're placed in college math at Long Beach City College. So, so we've been able to get to that point, and the dialogue is what's forced that realization that not only are we failing our students because of the assessments, but that we're not paying attention to the beauty of the assessment, which is the dialogue that should follow the assessment, which is the questions of why. Why are our students doing X, Y, and Z, and what's going on in their education in the K-12, and how can we as higher education help them better align or better assess or help students pay more attention to the test because many times students walk into a room, they take an assessment, they don't know what it's for and they don't really care. But, so, uh, uh, to make a long story short, that's what we're doing in Long Beach. It's paid great dividends so far. Uh, we see that our students in Long Beach Unified are now succeeding at higher rates at Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach than all the other students who come to Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach because of this dialogue and because of the work that we're doing early on in their education in Long Beach Unified. Great, thank you very much. Um, and, uh, um, and, and Juliet, you, you have a, several uh, challenges, but challenges related to this particular agenda is that you're working with transitions uh, both from high school to, to college, but also from community colleges to the university. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about uh, those challenges and, and how your university um, ha has, has dealt with that. Thank you for the invitation to come today, and thank you for um, allowing me to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in Texas. Um, I come from the very southern tip of Texas. Uh, when I say the most southern tip of Texas, that is we're a few blocks from the river, um, the Rio Grande River, and so and we're trying to buy those blocks. <coughs> so, so Texas is a very big state, and when I walked in today, I was looking for the table that said Texas, and uh, Britt said, well, it doesn't have a table. It probably has a whole room outside. <laughs> well, it wasn't true, and so I sat in the invited guest table. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to try to give you a little glimpse of why perhaps Texas is not here today or why they think they don't need to be here today um, and, and the, the kind of reality that we live in in South Texas relative to Austin, Dallas, Houston and the rest of the state. Um, uh, years ago we recognized, as all of us have, that this is not a new problem for us, that students are coming to higher education uh, with, with, uh, with a lack of skills. And I was a dean at the time, and so I went to the, to the math department and I said, why are you flunking all these kids in college algebra? And they said, you know, you can look at us, but you also need to look at the entering uh, skill level of the students coming to us. So then I went to the English department, I said the same thing. They re responded in much the same way, more polite than, than the mathematicians, but, <laughs> but it was still essence, you know, look at us and, and we'll look at our courses and those gatekeeper courses, but please also look at the entering skills of the students that you're putting in our classes. And so of course we did, and we discovered, much like Eloy has, that uh, at that time, over 80%, 90%, depending on the high school, 
of the students coming to us as a community college at that time were coming to us unprepared for freshman English, freshman mathematics. And so we, we thought it was a really simple kind of, this, there's a problem here, we'll come up with a solution. So the solution was to guide students toward the more rigorous coursework starting out in seventh grade. Sounds familiar now. And uh, at the time, this is in 1986, it, it uh, Hope Scholarship was just getting started in Georgia. And, and so some of you don't remember this ancient history, but for those of you who do, it was the first churn of, I think, innovation on this issue. And so we applied for some dollars in the Department of Education to raise some money and to get challenged to build a corpus of $3 million. Half of it would go to, to grow the corpus, the interest that it generated. The other half of the interest could actually go to distribute scholarships to students starting out in seventh grade who took the more rigorous courses, earned A's and B's in those courses, and then we would give them scholarship dollars, good for tuition when they came to the community college. It's very simple idea, people um, uh, knew that it was a, a bit of a solution to a massive problem. Uh, we sold it to the community, we raised our money, went out into the community, and, and sure enough, people started paying attention. Parents started to pay attention to what courses their students were taking. Teachers tried to make sure the students were aimed in that direction. Um, and so we thought we had solved this problem 20 years ago. And then as you should, after you've done this for a while, you try to do a post-assessment of whether it worked or not. So about 10 years later, we invited some university researchers from UT Austin. And by the way, I'm the president of UT Brownsville. We have a chancellor that would not like me to be promoted to his <laughs> position without letting him know. <clears throat> so I went to... We'll write him a note. Tell me what <laughs> so, uh, so we went to UT Austin and said, we need some researchers to come down and take a look at this program and see if it had impact because it obviously seems to be structured in a way that would entice students in the right way to take the tougher courses and come to us better prepared. Um, so they, they came and they tested it. And the news was there was almost no difference between the students that were taking the tougher courses coming to us as freshmen and the students who had not taken the more rigorous courses. It was very hard to claim success with the data looking at you in that manner. And so after a long while, we went back to research what had actually happened. In some of the schools, the courses themselves had been renamed to be, to qualify as more rigorous courses, but the content of the courses had not changed. And so students were now falsely thinking uh, that they were taking courses to prepare them to college, to go to college when they were not. We had to revamp the system. We, we revamped it several times. Um, Texas was not testing at the time. There were no exit level skills. There was no recommended curricula as there is now as the default curricula in Texas. So now fast forward to today. <clears throat> we started then a community college. I mean, this was the community college we were in. And what we discovered was once the students came to us, even after they were there, as Stan points out, they weren't moving through the community college. And so we decided, well, what is our responsibility in this picture? And what we felt, what we discovered was that of all the community colleges in the nation, even at the very best, only 17 to 19 percent, and Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, and I know he will, um, of those students that exit community colleges actually continue on to baccalaureate degrees, 17 to 19 percent at the very best of cases. And so knowing that Hispanics and blacks, women, students older than average, use community colleges as their major portal into higher education. And we were, we were in terms of a false promise, that picture, because we were inviting them in, they were coming in perhaps succeeding in, in, in somewhat, but not transferring to the baccalaureate degrees. And then we had the new century jobs looming ahead of us that said new century is going to require associate degree and baccalaureate and professional degrees. So we installed a, a university on top of the community college. I won't go into that story at this point, but simply to tell you that, that we said if we could remove all of the barriers 
uh, between a community college and a university that are traditional nationwide, if we could have a seamless transition between the two, if we could articulate all of the programs so that students don't have to start over from what they used to call a terminal degree, Associate of Applied Science, if we could somehow convert those into credit hours for students, then we can not only accept students in the university, we can, and we could act like a community college coming in, but we can scoot them through and act like a university on the way out. Now, the end result of that experiment after 19 years has, has been that we've doubled the number of students graduating every one year. They graduate the Certificate Associate Baccalaureate Master's and now a doctoral level. They're going to medical school. They're going to MIT from launch from our university. And two of them debuted at Carnegie Hall this last summer. And still, we are not producing enough. And that's the harsh reality that we find ourselves in. Uh, we changed our delivery system dramatically, in, changed from a community college at a traditional university to a community university. We change, we work with the schools and still we're not doing uh, as good a job as we need to. So I'm glad to be here to learn from other experts about, uh, about things that they're doing that might help us and, and to share with them some other things that we've got in mind for this next year. Thank great, you. great. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Britt, as chancellor of a, of a, of a multi-campus system, including the flagship, I mean, not only do you have um, uh, different kinds of campuses, um, but you have huge numbers of high schools that both have high-performing high schools that you work with and low-performing high schools. How do, you, how do you work on the communications and how do you help on the college readiness strategies? Uh, well, th there's an awful lot going on in, in, in Maryland. And uh, let me, uh, if I could, Stan, just sort of give the context within which uh, we, we operate. Uh, let me begin by saying how much I uh, uh, admired your analogy with the relay race. And uh, I think it's a very apt uh, analogy. And, and uh, for sure, higher education um, has a lot of work to be to do to ensure that baton is passed smoothly and uh, I'm not sure we've always um, been on the team so to speak uh, as I think we must be in, in the future in, in Maryland um, the, the, the context within which we operate is through a governor's p20 council and uh, I have a lot of I have great hope for the impact of this council and I think We've already seen some, some benefits uh, from it. Uh, the council is uh, structured uh, in such a way that the governor is actually the chair of the council and comes to the meetings. Um, there are five co-chairs, uh, myself, but uh, my colleague Jim Lyons, who's the secretary of higher education, Nancy Grassman, um, uh, our illustrious uh, superintendent, state superintendent of uh, schools, uh, in addition, we have the Secretary of Economic Development and the Secretary who has responsibility for workforce development. So those five people plus the governor. Then we have uh, business leaders, uh, faculty, um, uh, uh, superintendents. Uh, from, so it's a really good mix of people all committed uh, to ensuring that that baton gets uh, uh, passed uh, smoothly. And just to give you a sense of uh, what the P20 Council is doing, um, one of the things we undertook, um, uh, the governor appointed a, a task force on STEM, uh, STEM education, STEM workforce development in the state that uh, I had the privilege of, of co-chairing with June Streckfuss, uh, who's here today, uh, who's the head of the Maryland Business Roundtable for Education. And this STEM task force report was done a few years ago and actually fed into our race to the top uh, proposal. I mean, it was a ready-made uh, thing to sort of insert into that uh, uh, race to the top proposal, which Nancy Grasmick uh, led so effectively in Maryland. Um, and we then also formed under this uh, P20 Council a, a college success task force, which was led by uh, Jim Lyons and Nancy Grasmick. And uh, remember, Jim is the Secretary of Higher Education, Nancy's Superintendent of Schools, State Superintendent of Schools. So here you had the, the two uh, 
co uh, heads, coordinating heads of uh, education from the K through 12 sector and higher education working together on this task force, which came back to the governor, uh, governor's P20 council. And so, you know, I, I feel that um, there is the construct in Maryland to ensure that this baton uh, gets, gets passed uh, uh, smoothly. And in fact, it's, it's uh, under the con, uh, con, in the context of the P20 Council that we are participating in the Complete College uh, America, as one, one, one of the states, as you know. Uh, just real quickly, let me mention um, some uh, activities in Maryland that uh, I, I think are, are, are have great promise for, for our state. Uh, I'll sort of group them into two categories. One has to do with college readiness, the other has to do with college completion. And um, well, un under, under college readiness, um, because uh, we got an early start on this college success, um, we are already bringing groups together from higher education and K through 12 to work on uh, curriculum alignment and um, Again, under Nancy's leadership, we have a gap analysis um, uh, project already underway. And, and, and the thing that I think is, uh, holds so much promise here uh, is that it, the, the, this gap analysis involves not just the K through 12 uh, sector, but also faculty from, from our in institution. So we already have teams working together on this, on this gap analysis. And of course, we're part of the park a consortium led by uh, working with Achieve um, to uh, do the assessments. And uh, Maryland is fortunate to be one of the, I think, 11 um, uh, uh, lead uh, states in this consortium. And again, we've got faculty as well as K through uh, 12 teachers uh, in, involved in that effort. Um, within the system on, on, on college readiness, uh, there's one other thing that we're doing that uh, I feel is very important and maybe doesn't get enough uh, 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 conversation. Um, I had the privilege of chairing for the college board a major task force on uh, access and success. And one of the things that we observed in this task force work, work is that there is a dearth of information at the middle school particularly in low income and high minority uh, school districts where kids tend, would tend to be the first in their families ever to even think about going to college or go to college. And somehow or another, there isn't the, 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 the encouragement and the information necessary at that critical middle school stage to get people on track to get ready for college. So we've started within the system a massive, what we call Way to Go Maryland campaign, where we're taking information down to the middle schools with attractive brochures in both English and, and Spanish, uh, sort of laying out the course sequences that kids need to take if they're gonna be ready for school, explaining about financial aid, and arranging opportunities for these uh, 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 low-income school districts to act for students to go to one of our campuses and have an experience on, on the on the college campus. You know, I, I will I will confess uh, to the, my friends in California that we've sort of stolen this unashamedly <laughs> from uh, Charlie Reed, who had a similar uh, program that I think has been very effective in California. So uh, we, we're very pleased with that. This and and I can't um, not mention uh, Nancy. Shapiro, my colleague, who has been so successful, she works in the system office and has coordinated tens of millions of research grants from uh, the NSF uh, partnership programs, working with, uh, we're bringing faculty from our universities together with faculty in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Baltimore City, uh, and, and other jurisdictions, working on curricular alignment, having workshops for teachers, uh, uh, to, to uh, improve their, their, their skills, and, and I think these have all been very successful and have also provided excellent avenues of communication between higher ed and K through 12, which is so important. Let me just real quickly mention on, on the college completion side, I have become uh, a, a zealot on uh, course redesign. 
Uh, many of you probably know about the work of, of Carol Twig. Well, we have bought hook, line, and sinker into this co uh, course redesign effort, and I am absolutely convinced that it is a, a major piece of a, a overall strategy to improve co college completion. We have to understand that we have a generation of students coming to our campuses that are just not going to sit in a 50-minute 50 min, 50 lecture with 100, 200 students and sit passively there when they've got their iPods and their iPads and their, you know, their Blackberries and their uh, Twitters and everything going. I mean, it just doesn't work with this generation of students. So we have to, we have to redesign the classroom. <laughs> we have to redesign the classroom. We have done, uh, we've done some redesign projects to make it a much more active learning environment. And uh, we have, uh, we've done pilots on all of our campuses. And thanks to Lumina and to the Carnegie Corporation, we've gotten an infusion of money to ramp up our effort with this course redesign. Our goal is to take our 50 so-called gatekeeper courses, lower division, large lecture courses that are deadly for our students and quite frankly for the faculty, and turn them into exciting learning environments where there's an active learning uh, model. We're going to transfer them for all 50 of uh, our, our so-called gatekeeper uh, 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 courses. And um, uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, one of the, just one other word on the course redesign. What we have learned is it, it helps all students learn. But the students it helps the most are the students who are coming from low-income school districts and, um, and high, uh, minority, minority students because they're the ones that are the least likely to become engaged in these large mass classes. And when it's an active learning model, they do much better. Dramatic results uh, so far for us on that regard. We also have a huge achievement gap initiative uh, going within the system where we have gotten, for each of our 11 degree granting campuses, we know exactly what the achievement gaps are in terms of graduation based on race and income. Every campus has its own individually designed programs to cut that achievement gap in half by 2015 and eliminate it by 2020. And uh, presidents are held accountable for this. Uh, we've got uh, intermediate benchmarks uh, to show progress towards these, uh, this goal, and we report to our board every year on this. And then finally, we've been very aggressive with, on the financial aid side, uh, trying to ensure that we are not uh, uh, we're not contributing to this, uh, I think, a terrible practice of institutions buying high ability, middle class students who are going to go to college anyway and not having enough financial aid for those students where it will make a difference to go to college. So we have uh, <coughs> totally restructured our financial aid to ensure that the bulk of our financial aid is going to means tested, uh, for means tested uh, uh, purposes. And we've all, even just now launching a last dollar scholarship, we're calling it. This is for students who, um, you know, they're, they're, that have gotten through their junior year and they hit a financial wall and they drop out because they got to go to work or all sorts. So we've got a special, we're building a special financial aid pool to take care of these uh, students who have financial difficulty when they're within a year of, uh, of completing college. So anyway, that's sort of a list of things we're doing in Maryland and uh, pretty excited about it. Great, Britt. And okay. we'll let you know how to follow him on Twitter before the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can, can I move to Maryland? <laughs> In, in, uh, in, in introducing, uh, having Jamie talk, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, often reminded of a family discussion that we were having about um, the future, and I asked my sister um, what her goal was, and she looked at me, and she's deadpan, she said, you mean this weekend, what my goals are <laughs> for this weekend? Um, and as the, uh, um, and then she said, um, but Stan, you've taken all the goals. There's nothing left for me. <laughs> so as the owner of the big goal, uh, Lumina, uh, to, to raise attainment across the country, uh, sometimes the, the end seems very far from the beginning. Uh, how do we connect these agendas, Jamie? Yeah, I think it's very important to connect these agendas. You know, I was, I was sitting here, sitting here trying to decide if... Uh, oh. Let 
me try, yeah, okay. I think this one works. Thank you. I was sitting here trying to decide if, uh, if I'm here as the foundation person or as the, uh, or is it not working actually, is it? We'll make a switch. Sure, it's my magnetic personality. <laughs> I was I was sitting here as I was listening to my uh, distinguished uh, college president colleagues speak, trying to decide whether I'm here as the foundation person or as the policy person. So I've decided I'm going to do both. Um, I, uh, I was I was actually thinking about uh, the email I got in 2007 when I was uh, appointed as the president of the foundation from a member of Congress. I spent over two decades of my life here in Washington uh, working in, in the policy context. And uh, uh, he essentially said, a policy wonk leading one of America's largest foundations. That should be interesting. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to play a little bit of the, uh, the foundation role and talk about uh, what we love to talk about in foundation, which is what's the problem. Um, and then I'll put my uh, policy guy hat on and talk some about what are some of the solutions that I think particularly at a policy level we might want to, want to address in terms of, of, of these, these challenges. And as Stan pointed out, we've become very focused um, in a, in a, in a uh, almost uh, uh, monocular way at Lumina Foundation on getting to this goal of increasing the nation's level of high quality degree attainment to 60% by 2025. This idea of setting this national goal has now become, uh, I think, generally accepted in the, in the field. President Obama's talked about it. We've seen it in a growing number of states. College Board's done some excellent work on this. The Gates Foundation, many others. So we feel privileged to be in the midst of this conversation about getting to that goal, which is a substantial goal. Uh, right now, we are below 40% in terms of de degree attainment rates in this country. And uh, that is a long way to go in, in 15 years. Uh, but we think it's essential, and I think uh, I want to come back to uh, the critical point about the, the baton pass and, and, and the relay to, to build on, on the analogy uh, for a simple reason, which is that uh, the reality for Americans today is that college readiness is not the goal. As important as it is, as critical as college readiness is for our country, as essential as all the work that we are doing to make students ready for college is absolutely uh, required for our country, it is the attainment of a post-secondary credential that is the most important factor in defining the career and life success of the vast majority of Americans. Many of you probably saw the report from the Georgetown Center on Education and the Economy showing that 63 percent of all the jobs created between now and 2018 will require some form of post-secondary education. To put it somewhat more bluntly, if you don't have a post-secondary credential, you have a uh, two out of three chance of being poor. And so having a post-secondary credential is absolutely essential, but the baton pass, I think, that needs to take place is really the critical point of transition between high school and college, and in a way, um, all of the college readiness work is not even part of the relay. It is a part of the conditioning. It is part of the preparation that's so important. And from our perspective at the foundation, we think that that preparation needs to encompass not only academic preparation, which I'm going to focus mostly on in my, my comments today, but also social and financial preparation. We need to understand that the reality of the lives of students today is that even the most academically qualified students who have financial problems, family and other social issues, they will not go to college. And even if they do go to college, those students, we know from the research, have a very high a chance of failing once they get into college. So we need to address the academic, the financial, and the social preparation issues uh, for college as critical elements in this pathway to get to that high quality degree attainment. Now, the rest of the foundation's agenda, which I'm not going to talk uh, much about today, deals with what happens once you get into college. Um, certainly, the success rates of students in college, the completion rates, uh, are not acceptable, and that is something that we need to focus on significantly. And that encompasses really all of the target populations that 
are going to be critical to get to that goal. Low income populations, people of color, first generation students, and certainly adults, uh, which uh, I'm very concerned that uh, too much of our policy discussions have largely written off people over the age of 30. And I think that that's uh, not only not uh, morally acceptable, to, to go back to Alois' uh, analogy, but also economically unacceptable for us to write off so, such a significant proportion of our population. So the success in college issues are very important. And then the third, which all of the people up here are leaders on, is really redefining the productivity of the enterprise of higher education, focusing both on the sort of classic conversation, which is about the efficiency uh, of the system in terms of, of throughput, in terms of being able to maximize the effective use of the resources that you do have to produce high quality results, but also in terms of effectiveness and what, you know, the, the, the sort of classic economist definition where we're also making sure that we understand what a quality credential represents and what the learning is that's associated with a college degree. So that, that encompasses the work that we're doing and what we see as, as needing to, to, to be addressed. Uh, but I think that um, the, the critical ways to get there uh, are first to change practice, change practice at the K-12 and at the higher education levels. Uh, that means changing what our schools and our institutions actually do, uh, building uh, a network of support across the transition point between uh, high school and college uh, in many effective ways. Uh, the building the public's will for change is sort of underappreciated element of all of this, which is that uh, particularly once we get to the point where people are actually college ready, the majority of Americans don't really think we have a problem after that. And uh, I think everyone sitting up here will probably say, boy, we sure do. Uh, we have a lot of issues to deal with once we get to the post-secondary level and we've got to uh, address those. And then the third is to, to use the public policy lever uh, in appropriate ways, because public policy is not going to solve all the problems, but to use the public policy lever in ways that are really going to put our thumb on the scale of dramatic improvements in success for students. Uh, that is, uh, getting to those higher quality uh, degree attainment rates. So let me talk a little bit about some of the uh, issues that I think we need to be addressing at a policy level, uh, particularly as it relates to that uh, preparation side in terms of, of, of the transition. One is the work that you've all done, which I, I frankly find astonishing and impressive at how far the Common Core discussion went in such a short period of time. It's a great tribute to the leadership uh, of, of Achieve uh, and so many uh, other partners in, in this work. Uh, and I think that it's something that we can alear, learn a lot from at the, at the higher education level. Uh, but uh, I think that one of the things that we've got to focus on now is aligning what we're doing in terms of the college placement work, the college placement exams, with what we're seeing in terms of, of the Common Core. That is an, those are easy words to say, and that is really hard to do. Uh, for one thing, um, most of the discussion, I'm generalizing now, about the Common Core is subject specific. The college placement work deals with a broader set of issues, in my opinion, which has to do with the, both the, the subject matter knowledge, but also the generalizable skills that we're expecting that students will have getting into and then ultimately when they leave our colleges and universities, the ability to think critically, to analyze problems, to communicate, to do all those things that we expect you will get out of any type of college credential. So I think that is one issue that we're, we're going to have to confront, which is how do we align what we're doing in terms of the college placement work with what's happening in, in the Common Core. I think that we've got to do, and this goes back to, to Britt's point, uh, a, a better job of building these statewide uh, college outreach networks that uh, can produce and deliver college and career information at an early enough point for students to actually influence their decision making. Eighth grade is probably the critical transition point from what we can tell in terms of the research. Uh, but again, that is, that is hard work. That involves addressing the financial, the social, and the academic issues as part of the same rubric and not simply saying, look, we're just going to focus on one of those areas. It's somebody else's problem to deal with the other two. Uh, I think that we have to focus on um, uh, finding ways uh, to actually, once we get people into a higher education, 
accelerate their progress uh, towards a, a credential in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, there are many reasons why it takes so long to get a college degree. And, uh, but for many reasons, the time that it takes is a significant barrier to actual degree attainment. As uh, Stan Jones has said in, in some of his work, time is the enemy for a vast number of the students in our system in higher education. Because the longer they take, the more life gets in the way, the more financial pressures uh, inter intercede, and the more challenges these students actually have in terms of actually getting that credential. And it is the credential and the learning that that credential represents that's uh, so important in terms of this process. So we're gonna need to, to, to address, address those issues. And uh, we're gonna need to deal with, in a head-on way, uh, integrating developmental education with our post-secondary degree and credential uh, programs in new and different ways. Uh, I am someone who believes that students who come to us with remedial needs are not a problem, they are an opportunity. The opportunity that's presented to us is that they have shown enough interest that they're showing up on our college campuses and saying, I think I'm ready to learn. And what we do in higher education, to Stan's point earlier, is that we fail the vast majority of them for a lot of good reasons. Uh, my view is that much of the reason why that, why that happens is that remedial education developmental education broadly is really stigmatized throughout the entire process. Uh, I like to say that um, when faculty don't want to teach it, when students don't want to take it, and when policymakers don't want to pay for it, it's no wonder <laughs> that there's such a high rate of failure uh, in terms of, of developmental education. So that's, uh, that's an issue that we are going to have to tackle head on and not do what I, th what I have seen in my 25 years in this field, uh, which is spending most of our time trying to assign blame for, for who's at fault for the remedial uh, challenges that our students face. We've got to meet them where they are and we've got to find ways to actually address their success so that those students are actually uh, become uh, real matriculants and actually can succeed in our colleges and universities. And one of the ways that I think we can do that in higher education is to do a better job of embedding that, uh, that uh, remedial learning in the actual credit-bearing coursework rather than requiring up front this sort of pause before they get to the real stuff. It is that pause that often gets in the way. Now from a curricular perspective, it's a very complicated thing to do. But it is something that I think we've got to tackle <coughs> and hopefully philanthropy can play some role in this in trying to get some of that going at scale because we think it has huge potential. So there are a lot of other policy issues that I think we'll get to in terms of this conversation, but so those are some of the issues that I thought uh, I'd like to put on the table to, to get us going. Thanks. Great, that's very, very helpful. Thank you, Jamie. Um, um, there are three critical questions I wanna ask and, and all the panelists uh, you don't need to feel compelled to, to answer every one of them, but, um, and, and many of these, these issues we've covered, uh, but I, I think they're kind of critical uh, in this transition discussion. Uh, and, the, and the first one is, is that um, I, I can envision a day, uh, maybe in 10 years, uh, when my niece goes down to visit um, uh, her college and to meet with the counselor, um, and the counselor says, well, we'd like you to take this placement test, to see what level of mathematics and what level of English that you want to start with. And my niece Isabel says, well wait just a minute, and pulls out of her, her purse, I've got this letter from Mike Cohen. And, and Mike Cohen <laughs> says that I've completed Indiana Core 40 curriculum, and I've passed the uh, high school placement test, and the curriculum, I don't know if you know this, um, counselor, but the curriculum is based on the common standards that 47 states have adopted. And so I don't think I need to take this placement test. I think you should accept Mike's letter. And so, <laughs> and so my question is, is twofold. One is, would you accept Mike's letter and let my niece start without a placement test because she took the core curriculum, passed the high school placement test? And what can we do to strengthen the ADP agenda in terms of core curriculum uh, placement tests um, and those kinds of issues. Let me start, sure. not because I'm an expert, but because I'm 
faster, I guess, in <laughs> finding a, a hole to crawl into. But one of the things I did when, when I was invited to come here and, I, and someone that was uh, helping me think about it said, uh, you know, you'll, I said, how many people from Texas will be there? And they said, we don't think anyone else will be there. You might want to be prepared to talk about Texas in general. So I decided to make some phone calls to folks to find out what I didn't know that I should before saying anything. But one of the things uh, that I asked them about was this college readiness alignment for the high school exit exams in Texas having been at the forefront, or at least claiming to be at the forefront, of, of uh, setting college readiness standards in schools. So then we've already done it. Why am I still having students come that are not college ready? So I called the high schools and, and chatted with them for a while, good relationships with them, and I said, tell me what I'm missing here. What seems to be the problem? And, and there was lots of shuffle, and then I got calls back, and in essence it was, well, the standards have been set, they have been recalibrated several times, and by 2015, we will match college readiness exit at the high schools with entry requirements. At, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do for the next five years? And I said, now what happened? Why weren't they done faster? Well, it just takes a while to crank these things through the systems. And so part of it, I think, is that there really are good intentions on parts of states to, to deal with all of these issues. But as someone said earlier, unless you have teachers involved, you have teachers unions involved, unless you have it that universities all sitting at the same table with parents as well, then it, it takes so long to crank it through. By the time those standards have now been recalibrated up, we'll have children learning in a whole different way. And once again, we'll have misalignment. There's a wonderful book, and I'm sorry I don't remember the author of the book. It's Don't Bother Me, I'm Learning. <laughs> and, it is a, and if you haven't looked at it, it talks about children who are growing up in the digital environment. And the preliminary research, neurological research, that shows that their brains are actually getting wired differently and how they can be on their machines and listening to you at the same time and ingesting both at high comprehension levels. Because we can't doesn't mean they can't. So don't bother me, I'm learning, is a huge difference between the way we're approaching um, teaching and the way they are, as Britt mentioned earlier. I, I mentioned that to our faculty and talked about this gap. And one thing I thought was interesting, I'll just end with this, but in that book he talks about native digital learners. I don't think any of us would qualify. I know I have a grandson who qualifies for that. So all of us who are not native digital learners are immigrants to the process. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting use for the word immigrants? <laughs> and so all of us then have to relearn how to work in this new world because our students, our students coming to us, are learning in a whole different way. So so um, it's much more than just college readiness being aligned, those core standards being aligned with what our requirements are today. It's also course redesign. Uh, it's also knowing what makes for a successful college student. We said earlier, we know what doesn't work. And, and a few years ago we said, well, what does it work? What is it that makes for a successful college student? We know what those features are. They come straight out of high school. They've already taken the recommended curricula. They don't stop out. They take full loads when they're there. They don't work more than 20 hours a week. And if they work, they work on campus. And so we've reframed everything on our campus, scholarships, aid, campus jobs, to the successful student model. And one last thing in developmental ed that I think is, is really important that Jamie mentions. There is, it is hard for me to understand how you would embed an, a, someone who comes to you with eighth or ninth grade or tenth grade even skills in mathematics into a regular college algebra course and do that in one semester. But I want to know the first person who does it so that I can just borrow it and install it because that's, that's, that's magical. But if you don't move to that right away, What's the maybe interim step? And so it seems to me that one of the things that we've made a mistake in is this constant 
um, uh, uh, we've been allowing students to take developmental or remedial education over and over and over again, failing over and over and over again. And so we're putting a stop to that. We're saying you've had, you've had 12 years, you'll have one more. Brett. Stan, could I, I, I think you've asked a, a, a really uh, important question and um, I, I'm not sure my views on it will be uh, universally uh, popular. <laughs> um, uh, I think that uh, for us to assume that we could have a uh, college ready assessment that would then also be so uh, finely tuned that it could differentiate between the multiple of credit bearing courses a student would be ready, ready to take. Now, I look at this through the eyes of my own discipline in mathematics, and I'm so sorry to hear those mathematicians were so unpolite down in, in, in Texas. <laughs> they would not have been in Maryland. Let me know, assure you that that would have been. I'm sure. But the, uh, you know, I, I think the, the agreement that the students, if they pass the assessment, are ready to take college-bearing courses is a huge step, and I'm ready to go to the, uh, 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 go to war on that, that issue. I think that, that's ver very important. But just l thinking about my own discipline of mathematics, I mean, there are at least three different calculus courses at the University of Maryland. An honors calculus course, a regular calculus course for engineering students, a calculus course for people in the life sciences and, and, and social sci uh, sciences. So the, uh, a student passes this placement test, they're college ready for a credit bearing course, are they ready for, to take honors calculus? I don't think a, 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 an assessment can say. So what, what's wrong with a placement test? Knowing that the student's gonna take a, we wanna get them in the right course where they have best chance for success. They're gonna get a credit, credit course. And, and, and so, you know, these placement tests, what, they take an hour? I mean, it's not, uh, it, it, it's not that onerous in my mind. So I think it would be a mistake from my point of view to try to say that, uh, yes, you're, not, you're gonna get into a credit bearing course and you can take any of the credit bearing courses you want. I think we would not be serving the students well if we did that. Do you want? Uh, let me, I'll, I'll try to give you a short answer to that question. In my mind, if we've done the work to align the standards and we say that uh, Isabel has come out of high school college ready, we let her in and let the data tell us whether or not we made the right choice and then adjust from there. But, you know, to continue to say that we need to put them through all sorts of hoops when we're not even sure if these hoops, I mean, the, well, we know the hoops have not led to any greater success. Why do we continue to do that when we now have the ability to track these students and determine, is it aligned, is it working, and if not, we go back to the K-12 system and, and try to figure it out again. Those, these are great observations. Um, I, I want to take a different variation uh, of remediation um, and so, um, and actually to pick up uh, on Juliet's point, so Chris is graduating from high school this year um, and so not all these things are in place um, and we're always going to have students that, that kind of somehow, you know, get through our tight systems. Um, and so Chris was a C student and, and didn't do that well in math but he passed. Um, didn't particularly like math, and so he shows up at the community college, um, and um, he's placed in a math course. And he looks at me cross-eyed like, is this what I was planning to do when I wanted to go to college? And, and Jamie, I know you talked about remediation, but since you've really been on point on this, um, I want you to talk about, uh, 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 to answer this. Um, and uh, there was a recent study in Virginia, I think over 10,000 students, it was pretty impressive. Uh, and students who uh, were tested and, and were told that they needed remediation, 40% of them did not show up for the first class. Um, so, uh, so what do we do about um, the ones that are graduating right now uh, when these things are being put in place, let's say in Texas? 
Yeah, again, it comes back to that issue of, uh, you've sort of made my point, right, about the fact that there's a stigmatizing factor associated with this entire process that, that, that's very damaging. And, and I think that is something that we have to proactively address uh, at the policy level. And uh, I, I mentioned some of the ideas about the ways in, in, in which you, you can do that. I also think it's important uh, just to, I wanna go back to Juliet's point and then, and then uh, circle back to, 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 to where you are, Stan, which is that uh, there's a lot of redevelopment of how remedial education is actually delivered that needs to be done. I mean, we're very impressed with the ambitious effort that the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching is undertaking to try to rethink remedial math uh, uh, education. And I, I think that is, uh, that is uh, very challenging, very difficult, very expensive. We know that because we're contributing to it. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it is really important uh, because I think that the, the gap that Juliet was talking about about doing uh, eighth grade work and then showing, uh, eighth, having eighth grade capacity and expecting them to do college level work, there's a huge uh, gulf that we've got to traverse there in a fa fairly short period of time. And so there may be a variety of intervention strategies to get them to that point. My point is that I don't think putting them in a course or a series of courses and just saying, good luck, let us know if you, if you pass, um, is is an, an effective enough strategy. There's got to be a more comprehensive set of tools that we can try to bring to bear here because I am in favor, I think everyone up here is in favor, of, of trying to um, uh, fulfill the ambitions of these students who are saying they recognize they need a college credential to be successful in their life. So I think, to come back to your, your question, Stan, I, I think that there's a, um, there's a, a significant uh, hurdle for us that we're gonna have to overcome uh, in terms of, of getting students to understand that there are going to be things for which they have deficiencies and that that is a part of the collegiate learning experience. We have to reduce the ways in which those things actually become barriers by doing things like embedding what we can in the traditional coursework by finding ways to, to engage them uh, through, through um, uh, other means, through you know, the counseling work and, the, and the, uh, the more direct tutoring work that, that can take place with, uh, with students that have special learning styles, special learning needs that we need to get at. But we can't use a sort of wholesaling uh, model of trying to push them through a, a, a essentially a unified approach and expect that more than a third of them are actually gonna be uh, coming out of that system and doing college level work. Julia? I, I took a course in, from mathematicians I'm sure, um, in measurement and you know, uh, when I was at the research and measurement. First course when I went to the doctoral studies in linguistics and I thought no more math, <laughs> what, it, what, what happened here? So, so math follows you regardless of what field you're in. But it was a wonderful course. I took it during the summertime. It was a five week course. It was competency based modules. And as you went through the course, you saw the professor if you wanted to, but if you didn't, you simply learned it with your uh, colleagues and then took your test and went on and moved on and on. So I mean, it's very hard to do lots of things on university campuses. We started a university, so it's hard to start a university. It's hard to build one, to hire expert faculty. It's hard to get, hard to get through the legislature, but the hardest thing is to admit failure because you're the one that's always talking about your successes and you look for them and you laud them and you chamber of commerce them in every speech. So for a president to get up and say, we are failing at remedial education is so risky because of all the momentum issues that leaders are afraid to interrupt and still succeed. But like in anything else, that's finally what we have to do in developmental and remedial education. And once you say it, it's amazing, once you say it, then it's okay for everybody else to admit it. And once that filter comes off, then you're allowed to go into course redesign or into different, I asked faculty in remedial, in our developmental faculty the other day, why are we still teaching it in semester length courses? So the response I got was, because that's the way the state funds us. 
And I said, but students can, if they finish earlier, they obtain competency, they have to sit through the class for 15 weeks. Yes, ma'am, because the state funds us that way. And I said, so if the state were, if we could get the state to fund us differently, would you change? Well, absolutely. So I called up the Texas Commissioner of Higher Education. And I said, this is what I'm hearing. And he says, no, 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 Juliet. Last year, we put in a new funding model that allows you to offer classes differently. None of us knew that. Now, we're, we like to believe that we're up on top of what's going on. We did, it was a little known kind of adjustment somebody had requested, and it was made. So we would have stayed doing the things that we're doing had, had we not just dug a little bit deeper. So now we're, we're talking about, so it, now that you don't have to wait for 15 weeks, how would, you re, how would you change your course? So there's a new life that has been breathed in to the faculty, and I think part of it is to admit what's not working and then give permission for, uh, for experimentation because it's easy to talk about why high schools aren't succeeding. It's much harder to talk about why we're not succeeding when they get to us. Um, I, I want to ask this next question, so we'll, we'll have you two, um, you can add your comments, but, uh, but I want to ask this, uh, this third question that I want, because I think it's very important to this discussion. Um, so I, I was um, astonished when uh, achieved at a survey uh, of college algebra classes as part of their effort um, to work on their Algebra II assessment. Um, and to carry the analogy one step further, you're the, you're the third runner and you're rounding the turn uh, headed for the fourth runner and you see a maroon jersey, a red jersey, an orange jersey, a pink jersey. You say, now which target, who's, who am I handing this to? And I was astonished by a chief survey. I thought there would be differences at the margins on these courses across college campuses, but there were substantial differences. And there were actually, there were very few um, uh, standards or, or uh, uh, skills that were common across all these college courses. And so if the nation can come together behind a common core in respect to high school standards, should, um, and I realize maybe we need to do this by sectors, should the community college sector within California or within Texas um, or within Maryland um, essentially say, um, across the state of Texas, we're gonna have a common uh, set of standards for what college algebra is at community colleges, a common set for college statistics common set for, for communications, and so um, is, is, should this, this effort be carried on to the first year of college? Well, I, <clears throat> I would certainly agree with that. I mean, uh, California community colleges, I think, do a pretty good job of having common standards in their college algebra. Where we fall down is all of higher ed. I mean, let's face it, the first two years of higher education experience should be the same, no matter which system you go to. Uh, and so, you know, the step that we're looking at now is common course, um, common nomenclature, common numbering. Really, if a student takes college algebra at um, College of the Redwoods up north, it should be the same as Long Beach City College, it should be the same at Cal State Long Beach, it should be the same at the University of California, Irvine. College algebra is college algebra, and, and, and it should mean the same thing everywhere you go, and that would certainly make life easier for the high school students. So uh, I think California, community colleges have gotten pretty good at making sure. Now we do a terrible job at, at, at naming our courses and having, having common assessments, but, um, but we're on the verge of passing, having the governor sign a transfer AA bill, and then the next step after that would be to really look at uh, common course, this, this common core in our community colleges and at least at Cal State University. The UC, the UC system still lives on another planet in California, <laughs> but eventually they'll, they'll join us. Uh, Brett, you can answer well, this well, question or the other yeah, one. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think it's, for, for certain uh, entry level courses within a, uh, say a state system, I, I, I think it is possible to have uh, some sort of uh, Common def definition of learning outcomes, et cetera. So I, 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 I you know, I, I'm not sure that it, that can be taken 
too far into the curriculum, but uh, I do think uh, that, that it's possible for, for certain entry-level courses. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I just wanted to mention one other alignment issue that I think is very important as we think about the big picture in college completion. And it sort of touches on the, the quest, question you've posed, and that's the alignment between the two and four year in, in institutions. I think you, the community colleges are going to have to play, and I'm sure are eager to play, a huge role in this college completion uh, uh, effort for our country. I guess everybody would prob probably ag agree with that. And, um, you know, I think it, uh, J Jamie, it, it actually gets into a policy issue for, um, for our states. That is, th th there is enormous savings for the student and for the uh, state if two-year schools can really be the first two years of two-year two -year college be just like being the uh, first two years at a, at a four-year four -year school. The student saves money because tuition's lower. They don't have to live off, away from home. The state saves money because it's not. So as a policy issue, we ought to get the states thinking about scholarship funds to provide incentives. The state's going to save money. So why shouldn't they invest some of this saving in scholarships to, uh, for, for this transition? And I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in sort of in what you ra raised here, uh, Stan, about aligning the, the curriculum. We've done a pretty good job in Maryland. If you graduate from a community college in Maryland from, with an AA degree or 56 college uh, ready uh, cr credits, you are guaranteed admission to any one of our public institutions. College Park, which has very high admission standards, you can go to College Park if you've got a, a, a degree. Now, unfortunately, the students get there and they have to go back and take some lower division courses and nobody's happy about that. We've worked very hard in certain areas of high workforce demand, for example, teacher education. We have what we call an associate arts and teacher degree. And if a student finishes at a two-year school with that, they don't take any lower division courses. Those, the curriculum is so tightly aligned, they immediately are juniors when they get to a four-year school. We're working on this with nursing. We're even trying to tackle this with in engineering. But I think there's a huge opportunity for us as a country to, for the two-year and four-year sectors to really align this curriculum so there is no redundancy when the student comes to the four-year. The states save money, and let's help the students uh, by providing some scholarship support uh, uh, if they're willing to take that two-year then to four-year route. Okay, we have about exactly 10 minutes, and so uh, we're going to have quick questions and quick answers. So who would like to ask <laughs> a question? Okay, way in the back. Just stand up and talk loud. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jim Holloway from uh, New Mexico. I'm Assistant Secretary for Education for the state. And I guess I have a comment and a question. And, and, and I've, this is my first time with this group. And, and I think that what the panel has talked about has been very, very good for the secondary and the post-secondary programs. What we have found in New Mexico is that that's about half of the equation. What happens to the business community and where are the parents? For the, for the high school, students do not make a decision in high school whether or not they want to go to college or not. They make it in the eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth, fifth. And so what I would like for us to look at would be how do secondary, why do public schools engage the parents and in working with them for these children to make the decision to take the courses they need to take so they can do well when they go to college. So I think that that's one of the things that we as, as secondary uh, people need to look at is how do we engage the community and how do we engage the parents in a true partnership in bringing those children through so that they can, they can, uh, we can reach that 50% that, uh, that we were okay. talking about. Who wants to get that? Eloy? If I can just quickly, uh, in Long Beach, the way we do that, Long Beach College Promise, we begin in the fourth grade. 
every fourth grader, 8,000 of them, visits Long Beach City College. Goes through a whole session, we communicate with the parents and begin the education of how, what it means to be college ready, and what, it, what it's gonna take to finance your education and begin working that. Fifth grade, all of them visit Cal State University Long Beach and they go through the same orientation so that people understand going to Cal State Long Beach, going to Long Beach City College, it's the same thing. You need to be equally prepared. And that continues all the way through the 12th grade, some level of education all, until they're ready to go. Another question? Yes? Quick questions, yes. quick answers. Uh, Paul Susan, Connecticut Community Colleges. The uh, year-round Pell uh, from reauthorization allows students to continue fall, spring, summer, fall, and basically get now double the amount of Pell money. And I was just calculating in a four-year program, you can graduate at the end of your junior year and the community college, you can save five or six months. So in terms of acceleration, unless you're an agrarian community, unless you're an agrarian state, I would, uh, we've challenged Connecticut to do this, to take a look at all of our programs, we're now doing this in nursing, just to go straight through the summer and get the thing done, and I'm wondering what your response to that is. Julia. We had a 19% increase in enrollment this summer because of the Pell dollars, I'm certain, that were available to students. Uh, a huge increase. The difference that what we have to be careful with, as I understand the Pell requirements, is that next year, in order to qualify automatically for summer Pell, you've got to have completed 24 hours during the fall and spring semester. So this was kind of a free summer <laughs> Pell to entice and get folks interested. Our job is going to be to try and increase the average number of hours students take and complete fall and spring. Now we're gonna use that as leverage. So I think it's a wonderful new idea and a new great leverage. 62% of our students are on Pell. So if I can use that wonderful carrot to get them into completing more hours per semester so that they can attend summer with Pell, that'll be a very strong persuader. Sam, Next qu oh. Oh, oh, real quick, okay. uh, T Towson University in Maryland is experimenting, has a pilot of having year-round school so that uh, students can finish in three years. Uh, I think it's a very interesting experience, and I'm pleased to hear your comments about uh, Connecticut because I think that's uh, an important initiative. Yes? I noticed um, in the bios, two of you, you were the first person in your family to go to college. My uh, question is, do you have any ideas about anything special that, uh, that you do in your universities or that you do in, in, in making the path easier or better or more effective in getting uh, that particular individual, that first person that's ever gone to college in their family through? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, Jamie, since you're a first generation student, speak more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's really important. that we, are, we already got to it. You've got to get to those students at an earlier point in time, particularly those, those first generation students and the, the kinds of things. There's a, actually an interesting campaign right now sponsored by the Hispanic Scholarship Fund that is targeting um, um, students who would, be, who would be first generation by getting this message to families that in fact having someone in your family with a, with a college degree can have a transformative effect. You've got to get to those first generation families at a very early point. And messaging to the parents is as important as messaging to the students. Juliet deals with a substantial population that's first generation. I just might mention the early gear up grants that started out aimed directly, they had aimed at, at curricula, aimed at teacher uh, development, but also aimed at parents. And what we found in the, participating with the gear up program that really aimed at seventh through 12th grades was that when we would be talking to parents about financial aid available for their students, the, the mothers would come and sign up for classes ahead of their children. And so talking to parents not only supports the child, it might open that door to the family even a way ahead of the child. In the back. I'm Sue Kane from the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education. And I want to know how uh, states are aligning adult education standards because so many of our students are adult and come through adult education programs 
to the Common Core standards and what initiatives have taken place there. Who wants to tackle that? Uh, you know, in, in California, our community colleges take the top 100% of students wherever they're coming <laughs> from. So, you know, adult, anywhere in between, they come in, our job is to get them ready, regardless of whether where they came from, and so we, we get them ready to, to, get, to come into any university. Uh, of course, we deal with the same issues that we're dealing with the high school students and under preparedness, but uh, much of the answer is, is the same. Next question. Yes. Good morning, uh, Francis Haycock, Chancellor, K through 12, Florida. Uh, I just have to add this, it's not exactly a question, uh, to the New Mexico qu uh, answer. Um, how, how do you get a K-12 kid really involved in going to college? Uh, everything that was said was correct, but it's not sufficient unless a state takes a policy move in increasing the rigor of the curriculum in the elementary, middle, and particular high school so that the courses that are required for college ready are not at the whim of some counselor or some parent or some uh, agency to be able to move it. It is not going to happen. So there has to be intentional policy at the state level to increase the graduation requirements. And also, for example, in Florida, we have a whole high school graduation policy where we, we rank schools A through F, used to be all test scores, and now half of it is college readiness. That's great. Okay, thank you. I think we have a, who's got a question? Okay. Margie Lau, uh, Governor's Office, State of Oregon. Uh, I have really two questions. Uh, one, I didn't hear anyone speak to uh, the students taking college courses while they're still in high school and ways in which you're encouraging that, particularly for first-generation students. And second, how are you handling this in the midst of uh, the tremendous fiscal difficulties that several of your states are having? It, Texas passed a permissive legislation to allow us to offer dual enrollment. We now have 6,000 students that are not actually at our campus that are in dual enrollment classes in, uh, in the high schools. Um, and the way we're handling it fiscally is that we're not charging tuition to the students. We're paying uh, for the teachers, but we are um, counting on appropriations reimbursement in Texas, which comes two years later. And, it's, and, and it's, uh, it's how we do things in Texas. We teach them now, we wait for reimbursement two years forward. So we're doing the same thing with there, except that we're not charging tuition. Those students who take those courses ahead of time, as now we've had experience with that over about six years, uh, come to us, of course, better prepared. They're self-selected in those courses. They've already met the college, egg, I mean, the high school exit criteria. They come and take more classes and, and, and simply succeed at better rates. So in part because they're self-selecting to get in there, but it's so important because that senior year, sometimes the best students kind of drop off the radar screen because they're bored to death and they're ready to move on, but the clock doesn't let them quite yet. So it's, for us, it's been powerful. D Paolo? Jamie, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say real quickly that you know, we've begun moving in this direction uh, modestly in, in Maryland. I think it's a very important area to e explore, but my understanding is that the state of Virginia has the uh, an excellent early college uh, program. I don't know if anybody's here from Virginia, but uh, they've really pushed into this, I think, in a, in, a, in a big way, and it may be we could all learn from what Virginia's doing. Too. Paula? Uh, for Long Beach, what opportunities are there for your faculty at the college level to interact with faculty at the high school? I ask because these students are taking that test in the junior year, so there's still some opportunity in the senior year, and I'm trying to figure out uh, the more I, I think we've seen that college and high school faculty can get together, the more they can both learn from each other. Uh, that's a great question, and that's the key to the early assessment program. The test leads to the dialogue. And the dialogue between math faculty at the K-12, at, com at community college, at the university, talking about what are the barriers and what can we do to assist you in the K-12 system to overcome those barriers and align your curriculum with our curriculum. Good example, English. High schools, we're not teaching expository writing. College, you get to college, what are you looking for? Expository writing. We created a course in the 12th grade on expository writing to help those students bridge to university and community college uh, English course. 
Okay. Um, in in closing this, we w we want to ask the last question of Mike Cohen, and we would like to know from Mike uh, where does Achieve want to take this agenda? Um. Thank you, Stan. Well, w you know, w one of the comments I heard that was particularly interesting to me is actually one that that, that you you kicked off with. Uh, reference to the study we did of uh, first year college algebra uh, courses. And we too were struck by the tremendous diversity in those. And we've heard from time to time from folks uh, in the ADP network some interest in exploring uh, whether it's possible to get to a more common set of at least first year courses. So if there's interest in that, that would be one area in which we would be interested in proceeding. The second uh, uh, would take a longer time to respond to, but all of the issues that came up around uh, uh, college-ready assessments in high school are things that we will be dealing with in the uh, uh, Partnership for Assessment of College and Career Readiness in the PARC proposal, assuming it gets funded. So there's a lot of discussion to be had about how best to do that, and we'd welcome a dialogue with everyone on that. Great panel. Thank you all very much. Great to be with you. Great to meet you. Great working group.